So, each and every morning, I come down to breakfast, and the newspaper is there on the table. I go and make my cup of tea, and I wait for the hot food to be ready. And I open the newspaper, and every so often, I let out a sigh, probably at least once a month. Not from the daily political ramblings, but one particular trend article. And the article is practically copied and pasted. It will start off by saying how bloated public spending is on defence. It will then say that the defence industry is sending defence systems to all the wrong places, despite the fact that that is the choice of the government. And it will criticise the government as well. After this, it will compare Britain to any nation that's currently at war. It doesn't matter whether they are ally or enemy, whether we're at sort of war with them at the moment or not. Currently, it's Ukraine and Iran. Before that, it was Syria. And before that, Afghanistan. And I'm assuming, I didn't read the newspaper back then, but I'm assuming there were also comparisons to Iraq, Afghanistan again, and Libya. Uh, but they all say a similar thing. All this stuff, they'll say that uh, they are, there are countries that are beating our systems, our military prowess, despite a very sparse level of funding. They'll quote the price of a British weapons system, and they quite like this one because it's been fairly constant. The most recent was the classic Storm Shadow missile, being compared to the Iranian kamika uh, kamikaze drones that are being used by Russia. Now, before that, uh, it was Brimstone, the missile, being co compared to the uh, sort of adapted drones, improvised drones that drop grenades used by the Ukrainians. Before that, I think it was uh, claiming that the Typhoon was entirely obsolete because AA missiles exist, and that apparently makes all aircraft obsolete. Then the final line will be something along the lines of, it's not to say that it's not important to defend ourselves, or that there aren't good arguments for having such expensive systems, but this most recent conflict, whatever it might be, uh, proves that defence stuff costs too much and that we can be doing it better. Should we not allocate our spending elsewhere? And that's pretty much the way it you know, works every single time. Now, obviously, I don't actually agree with this. In my view, of course, no. Uh, if anything, the current British arsenal is too small. But, and this is rather, a, you know, it's rather big, these newspapers do, to an extent, have a point. Now, I think the newspapers are hyperbolic, of course. I think many of them harbour their own agendas that they're trying to put forward. Of course they do. But while defence spending is necessary, there is a point about how expensive unit cost is becoming. Do these people have a point? Well, yes and no. One can talk about asymmetric warfare all day. One can talk about how there are good solutions being developed in desperate places for cheaper. One can make a very good point that a lot of HICs, developed nations, let's say, relying upon more and more absolutely fantastic weapon systems are spending too much. And of course that drives up costs and drives down the number simultaneously. Overall, the point is, for all the defence industry is trying to make the most advanced, incredible, really valuable, science fiction to science fact, otherworldly potent solutions, they are expensive. And the number of them is declining. So the question I'll be answering today, which I won't be able to properly because it's really tricky in such a short period of time, uh, is are systems too expensive within the British and really Western defence budgets? And if so, how can we fix this? And how can the defence industry fix it in general? Now, I've talked about the former part of this bit uh, before, but the latter is something a bit more new. Primarily, if you look at the unit cost of defence systems within the Western world, generally one sees it increase as new systems are developed, even factoring in inflation. Uh, units count, I guess, keeps going down. As time has passed, simply prices have risen and quantity has fallen with what the government is buying. Some see this as a simple trade-off. Quality over quantity. That's a good thing, right? Now, it's better to have, of course, 100 F-35s than it is 10,000 World War I biplanes. It's better to have better missiles on your warship than it is to have more guns. And, in part, this comes from war economics. That is to say that one of, if not the most important factor in who, in who wins or loses a war is who runs out of money first. Without money, a war effort cannot be sustained. 
unless there is an entirely totalitarian government, and often not even then. Therefore, it's considered a worthwhile trade-off. If, let's say, I have an allotted amount of money to buy torpedoes, I have two options. I can buy a large number of decentish torpedoes at 200k apiece, or I can buy a handful of mind-blowingly excellent torpedoes of 1.2 million pounds per piece per unit. Now, the latter means that while it does cost more, and that's not necessarily such a good thing, I won't be able to buy as many, it will be able to sink the enemy's warship. A 1.2 million cost to uh, the government or the taxpayer for that torpedo, and then likely hundreds of millions in cost to them if our forces can sink the ship, meaning they either now don't have a warship or they have to build another one at great expense. And that's probably a good thing, that is how wartime economics works. Additionally, if I build an attack helicopter with better armaments and better protection, and more expensive engines, let's say, that helicopter is less likely to be brought down. Meaning, not only does one save life, but one saves money on the unit, means the system isn't lost. And better systems mean, effectively, there's less money to spend on maintenance. Now that sounds smart enough. In my view, I've talked about this before. Uh, considering this cost isn't going to waste, considering it's meant to make it more sustainable, uh, more long-term, more potent, and that's probably going to save money if you actually go to war. Uh, it's not necessarily such a bad thing, given that it's going into the most elite defense systems you will ever see. Now again, I don't consider that such a waste of money, I don't consider it such a bad thing, and nor do governments, clearly, because that's largely been the policy. But nonetheless, the high unit cost does still raise a number of questions, as well as a number of eyebrows. Now, first off, if such a cost is sustainable, uh, is it sustainable, really? Uh, especially during times of war. And at the moment, one could say it probably is, but continuing on this trend without changing something would likely lead to unsustainability during wartime. To the extent that if a single ship, if a single plane has a major breakage, failure, or gets damaged, and vehicles often do get damaged in war, then there is a huge issue for the fighting force. Now you may say, with reducing military enlistments, only a few pieces of huge kit can really be employed. We don't have enough people. And this is effectively the line of argument, that if we can get more, you know, exquisite, elite systems, they're less likely to get shot down, and that means we're all fine. But the fact of the matter is, one does still need a decent amount of uh, equipment for war, uh, and at the moment, while we might not have enough people necessarily, we are moving into a new age, a more autonomous age, where that isn't going to make much of a difference, where the personnel count isn't going to make so much of a difference in what the military can employ. And for such an age, we're going to need better solutions by the defence industry, as well as likely cheaper solutions. Now, effectively, uh, the issue is arising that these systems are becoming too expensive, and therefore there are too few of them. If you have too few systems, issues arise. Uh, and in an age where logistical value is, or logistical prowess is getting better, in an age where autonomy is increasing, meaning there's less management needed, then it's potentially a necessary thing in order to increase the number of units we have, even if that means reducing quality because one can't necessarily rely on these elite systems, which, you know, then have a 60-year um, lifespan, and then they're replaced after that, being rather old and decrepit. Now, call me foolish, an idealistic member of Generation Z, but there is a means by which we may be able to have the best of both worlds, to have our cake and eat it too, both a lower unit cost, as well as more units bought, or, let's say funds redirected to where they're going to do the most good. Now that does sound like a fantasy, but there are a number of interesting angles from which we can take this. Now the base of this, or the first that I'm going to talk about today, is the idea of the SpaceX model. The reason that firms don't often try to make the most innovative solutions is because their their goods within the defense industry are price inelastic. If the military needs a satellite launch for a cruise missile system GPS, their demand is inelastic. That is to say that pretty much no matter the cost, within reason, but within fairly large reason, they are going to launch that satellite. 
Uh, and the same can be said for the creation of a frigate. The government lists it, need it, needs it, and will take the best possible bid, even if that bid is technically overpriced. Because whatever happens, generally no matter the cost, the military is buying that satellite. It's buying that frigate, and of course, uh, with the example of the frigate, it's even more pertinent, because it's a longer process of creation, which means higher sunk cost for governments in research and development, in site management, in logistics. And what we see is for some of these super projects, um, the case can be that uh, it is price and elastic, and they are very, very expensive anyway. And that's not necessarily because firms are trying to scam the government or trying to charge too much, but nonetheless, they are expensive. Now, how can we reduce, co reduce costs just overall? What SpaceX does, which I think is interesting, uh, is it allows lower launch price. And it's not just innovative technology. It's domestically made technology, which allows for excellent proximal com uh, sort of corporate command uh, controls, as well as reducing product agglomeration. Uh, de-agglomeration, if that's even a word. Now, within the space industry, it is one of the most priced and elastic industries on the planet. A satellite, again, a rocket, it's getting launched, no matter what happens. And this is where it's largely been inflated in the past. Firms think that they can take the easiest supply chain route, and that is generally to buy from China. Within the space industry, a lot of parts are bought from China, and so product cost is high due to that agglomeration. In short, if you have, let's say, materials and electrical firms, which are in China, which sell at a huge markup to component manufacturers, those component manufacturers then sell the synergized components, which are probably within China as well, at a huge markup. Then those aerospace parts from the component combination are sold at a huge markup to space firms. And it's different firms handling this each time. And at each stage, they pass on not only their cost, but the markup as well, meaning, you know, the large number of stages, particularly for stuff in defense, in space. Because it's so complex, there's a lot of stages, meaning the markup is huge because you have an agglomeration of these markup markups at each stage. So in short, the issue is with the supply chain. And space, SpaceX really has chosen to combat this through more domestically built technology, which can then reduce the overall cost of launch because there isn't huge passed on markup agglomeration combination cost. Uh, SpaceX technology development centers, uh, machining centers are all fairly close by to the headquarters. And of course, once economies of scale set in, uh, that cost becomes even further reduced. And that's how SpaceX has managed to reduce the cost of launch of rockets so very much. And then one could say, so the problem and answers are simple then. Let's produce whatever defense systems we need at home. Well, not quite, unfortunately. In the US, th this may be somewhat achievable. Uh, SpaceX has actually somewhat proven that. Uh, but for the UK, which has lost a great degree of its manufacturing industry, this would be far more difficult and require a shift in the UK's sector makeup that would have a huge impact and would be really quite significant. And obviously that doesn't change overnight, so these problems can't get fixed anyway. Also, the idea of Chinese components has been an issue, in particular, the manufacture of certain jets. I'm not going to name any names, go look it up. Um, but there is a degree of scrutiny on that anyway. So is it really buying from abroad that is the issue? Moreover, we see these markups from abroad. We see, let's say, markups from buying materials from China, but we also see huge component markups from imported systems as well as imported components from our allies. And this is largely where a decent part of the issue lies. Let's say within the US, the UK and France, a system that is undergoing collaboration will start in France, move to a second state of manufacturing in the UK, then move to the US for a third, back to the UK for the fourth, back to the US for the fifth, and back to France finally to th for the sixth. And then, of course, you have a uh, huge logistics cost in the delivery of that overall. Uh, and because of national security, you can't necessarily aggregate those or aggregate the sites in order to make that simpler. Uh, so it's imported components from our allies, which is also driving up the cost, as well as supply chains from countries like China, 
Allies might also face similar markup problems the higher you go up the supply chain. So how could one go about achieving the solution we talked about? A solution which has managed to lower SpaceX's cost of launch, but not lead them to be profitable, unfortunately. Um, how can we increase qual quality uh, and quantity while decreasing price? And the answer is we also need to find a way to make this profitable. SpaceX has issues with creating profit from this model. Uh, the fact of the matter is, you don't launch rockets that often, and defense equipment isn't bought that often. So we need to find a way to make this profitable for larger firms which work within these sorts of projects. More profitable than the initial charge that they can just get from, I guess you'd say, brainless logistics or simplified logistics. Uh, how can we solve this realistically, or perhaps in a shorter time frame, without having to change the total industry? or the total industrial makeup of the United Kingdom, or move our domestic firms to places where manufacturing is ample for the need in this sort of situation. Because it's clear that someone is not making the move to facilitate this. And we could begin with the government. We could say that rewarding these sorts of practices to decrease cost, maintain quality, and increase quant quantity uh, could be achieved through flexible and sort of definitively ranged product potential counts in a tender rather than a set number, which would give a higher count, of course, uh, and with automate, I guess the increase in automated systems, this could be easier, but of course that's no simple matter for logistics. Uh, and with maintained quality, there is more favorable perception. Realistically, government schemes in order to achieve this would be difficult, so it seems that Given it is associated with the supply chain of defense firms, the defense firms are the only ones who can really choose to take this action in order to lower costs, especially in peacetime, which we are currently, thankfully, in. So the first question we have to ask is, how could the defense firms do this? Because that is secondary. What we need to be asking, actually first, I think, is why they haven't done it already. And to an extent, it is because uh, it's a rather new business model. And I don't think it necessarily has uh, a good perception as working for big business, coming from more new age firms. Uh, yes, I think there are another few reasons why firms aren't implementing this yet. First off, obviously, it's a lot of effort to make in these huge corporate mechanisms in a market that might not actually reward the firm that does it for the, this sort of revolutionary change uh, and might not reward those who propose it within senior management. And that's fair enough. Additionally, it's associated, of course, with supply chain. Now, changing supply chains is another very tricky business, another revolutionary change which would have to take place in order to reorient the industry itself and the firm itself. And considering how already ruthlessly efficient supply chains of defense, uh, particularly of these large firms, BAE, Raytheon, let's say, uh, how ruthlessly efficient they are at the moment, and that's a good thing, there is little chance that such a proposal to change them up would go down so well. If a firm starts making twice the number of planes or torpedoes, then it also doubles the logistical difficulty. And that is really where this all ends, is logistical difficulty, which is something that these firms don't want. Also, naturally, firms want to preserve decent profit margins uh, and the benefits that come with high price and being government compliant, um, and as well as government compliance as well in aiding procurement, uh, R&D, all of those processes financially, not just in regulation. Uh, there's also the perception that these systems are high priced because they are so elite. Higher price is seen as higher value, and so the product passes the elite system threshold. So all in all, it's a lot of effort uh, which will come at expense. You don't want to mess up supply chains because that can screw up the entire business and corporate practices. Uh, and it's not necessarily that beneficial, at least in the short term. Uh, and it would take a long time to implement, and it's not so needed at the moment. So unless the government makes it clear that they need it, and that they can't operate otherwise, then there is no real way to do this. So why would firms change? Well, I think they would, without the government having to say it's a necessity. First off, it would of course be better for the government, making a more consolidated relationship particularly, as sort of superior and more systems automation takes place but of course it would take a long time 
20 years, let's say, and that's been an issue. But the fruits of changing this to lower cost would likely lead to market domination. Other firms simply wouldn't be able to compete on price, and these firms would be able to increase profit despite the fact they're lowering prices. It would propel the firm that did this to the forefront of high-end defense. And I need to crystallize my thoughts on this. Obviously, this is a bit uh, hither and thither in a proper manner, really, because this video is a bit all over the place, but I'll get there. For the minute, I only see partial implementation. I don't think one can entirely reduce costs in the way that SpaceX has and still remain profitable. Certainly not these large firms, which have such an enormous corporate bureaucracy, and I'm not saying that's such a bad thing. I've thought about the logistics of this as best as someone who's not yet involved in the industry can. And I could see the implementation of this partial cost reduction strategy uh, taking effect within five or six and a half years, if properly Im implemented. Maybe a bit more than six, if done really efficiently. Materials, as well, outside the supply chain are... Uh, they could lead to greater component creation, effectively, if there was more control of those materials. Now, this would have to start at the higher stages, of course, but defence giants likely have the funds to implement this. So let's say within the UK, to me, it would entail the creation of common component manufacturing facilities, meaning you can effectively agglomerate costs for firms across the UK, common across constantly supply, supplied technological goods to the government, contracts that have already been won. One could take this from the bottom up or the top down, but likely the top down would be the least risky. And that's what the defense firms would go for. And that would involve either directly uh, or sort of through vertical in integration, uh, letting firms manufacture, let's say, avionics systems, oceanographical systems, creating those development sites, manufacture sites in a nucleated area and putting that area, uh, new infrastructure, close not to a, an RAF base or a Royal Navy base, but close to supply chain centers. Let's say Farnborough, for example. Now, this is what needs to be seen, really, that the cost savings come with this through logistics, not deliverables. One hugely reduces movement time if you're not importing from China uh, or Im importing to a centralized hub uh, in huge bulk. Even if it's further from a naval or air base, it will save on time. And these firms, which are seen as big and slow, can be more efficient. Now, this would be best for the top-down approach, but potentially, again, being an idealistic Generation Z man, one could create larger manufacturing facilities for a bottom-up approach, particularly within perhaps the northern areas, uh, as car manufacturers are seeming to do, but for electronics manufacturing and the creation of components uh, on the smaller end. Now, this would be hugely beneficial because the idea of modular industrial sites dependent on product requiring a core really and this is the crux a core of strong middle managers who can have a quick adaptation rate for changing electronic systems development and manufacturing as well as plants that can facilitate this it would be pretty positive reduce the overall cost but more importantly reduce the difficulty of logistics meaning that a number of things uh, could take place. One could save on logistics, of course. Logistics are simpler in general, which is a nice thing. Uh, but it also means that there is increased capacity uh, for the complex logistics needed for, let's say, increasing product output. Now, of course, one would start for smaller systems, but it's also realistic within these elite larger systems that I'm talking about, the ones that really are cost inflated, the ones that really are becoming, in the eyes of some people, too expensive, and that's reducing their quantity too much. Think the Augusta Westland Apache, the Tempest, HMS Glasgow. Uh, I believe that the key to that would be in trying to reduce the number of component imports from places like China, of course. Uh, but that might, might not be realistic. Uh, so potentially sort of the increase of joint venture is my idea. Now, of course, in the modern day, a lot of products are made by consortiums or at least partnerships. Now, if you look at something like Eurofighter, which is made by a consortium, uh, 
past submarines, or even firms like MBDA, which are a sort of perma-consortium partnership, not simply for projects, but for building something that is specialised. There is a lot of joint venture between firms within the defence industry. Now, how can we maximise this? How can we maximise the consortiums and partnerships that already exist? Well, what could work is national firms forming consortiums for supply chain collections. That is to say that firms could work together uh, in, let's say, a nation like the US, which is pretty huge. They could work together in order to make supply chains more efficient and more centralised. Now, that doesn't mean that all firms would be lovey-dovey, but rather realise that there is mutual benefit in lowering certain costs from uh, centralised hubs. You have locations for higher proportion shipments that could then be divvied up based upon who paid for them. Or something more like MBDA, but for materials, creating bottom-up systems in a more collaborative fashion. And this can be managed by the defence firms themselves, and therefore you don't have to employ other logistics services in order to ensure it can happen. And of course, there will be someone in the comments who says that what I'm saying is communist, because they're entirely mistaken. And no, of course not. Don't take it the wrong way. In fact, it's very capitalist. In the best interest of the firm to lower costs uh, through common materials and components consortiums. And then, of course, competition ensues as it normally would. But rather more importantly, established supply for contracts, already one, that are dealt with over a long period in sort of constant supply that the Army needs, that the Navy needs, that the Air Force needs, uh, that benefit greatly from economies of scale because they are in constant supply, can have lowered costs vastly, particularly if we're talking about not only perma consortiums, but aligning this with centralized, let's say, electronics manufacturing plants. And this is largely. Uh, about the idea that firms can reorient manufacturing su for supply and contracts, one in the past, uh, as well as combining that with reorientation in the same way of R&D, to a greater degree. And of course, the creation of all of this infrastructure means that, God forbid, if there were a major war, the UK could also kick into gear, and firms could work better together, produce better products for the military. Now, all in all, I'm not saying this could work right now. Is it idealistic now? Yes, someone would have to find a way to do it and it would be incredibly difficult. But one could find a way at some point to reduce unit cost, keep the brilliant systems that we have uh, and make in the UK actually capable of sort of kicking into industrial action as it did during the Second World War. People will call this view Updated. They'll claim the situation of war is impossible. Well, I don't think so, and I think it's rather important that we have that sort of preparedness. Uh, many would point for that particular example at the place the space firms are sourcing a lot of their components. Nonetheless, having a higher cost per unit is no reason not to achieve this. After all, it was done in a market where a single unit could cost £4.1 billion. All I'm saying is, Think about it. Uh, similar quality, higher quantity, more efficiency, better logistical value. It really is as simple as that. And I've rambled on for too long now, so I'm turning out a bit like those newspapers I mentioned at the beginning. I'll leave it there.